Disaster Safety and Preparedness. My name is Sarah Miller, and I am the Communications and Public Affairs Specialist here at Child Care Aware of America. Uh, we're so excited they are able to join us for tonight's webinar, and we're actually going to do tonight's webinar a little bit differently than we have in the past for those of you who have joined our previous webinars. Instead of doing questions and answers only at the end of the webinar, we're going to do questions and answers as we go through each of the sections. So if you have a question that comes up as we're doing the webinar, please feel free to type your questions into the questions box as we go along. I'll be sure to keep an eye on the questions and read them aloud when we have the opportunity to go through them. Um, for those of you who are interested in receiving certificates for tonight's webinar, our certificates will automatically be sent out within the next two weeks to those who participate in the live webinar and not the recording. And you need to participate in over 75% of the webinar. And if you are watching the webinar on a mobile device or a tablet, please be sure to email me so I can make sure that your certificate is sent out to you within the two-week period. Um, before I hand over everything to Tammy from FLASH, the Federal Alliance for Safe Homes, we're going to have a quick poll to kind of get an idea of who's on the line tonight. So you should see the poll on your screen just so we can understand who is a parent, who is a provider, and others who are participating in our webinar. And I'll give everyone just a few more seconds to enter in their vote. While everyone is voting, I would just like to announce that tonight's webinar will be recorded and available on our YouTube channel. Um, it should be posted by tomorrow, so if you'd like to send this webinar to anyone else that is looking for information regarding disaster preparedness, please be sure to send them to our YouTube page. Okay, so it looks like, um, as you can see, the majority of people on today's webinar are providers. We have some parents. Um, a few members of R&R &R agencies, and then 10% of you are others. Um, just as a note, we will be having two other polls as we go through tonight's webinar, and we look forward to having you answer all of the questions so we can keep everyone fully engaged. So at this time, I would like to hand it over to Tammy, who will take us through tonight's webinar. Okay. Good evening, everyone. This is Tammy Filion. I am Senior Vice President of Outreach and Communications for the Federal Alliance for Safe Homes. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. I'm looking forward to talking with you guys this evening about disaster safety and preparedness. What I'd first like to talk with you guys about is a little bit about FLASH. Our mission specifically, we are considered the nation's leading consumer advocacy organization for disaster safety, and our mission is strengthening homes and safeguarding families, and we do that in a number of ways. We do that by promoting strong, well-enforced building codes and standards. We work with consumers and thought leaders who understand and value stronger, safer buildings. We work with higher education, and that includes high school and graduate, postgraduate, to embed resiliency and um, also build model curriculum as it relates to building codes and mitigation. We also work with several different industries to promote incentives tied to disaster safety and mitigation. And we promote innovation in all sectors as well as research. Some of the partners that we work with and that support our organization include those that you see on this screen, including the American Red Cross, BASF, FEMA, Home Depot, the Institute for Business and Home Safety, the International Code Council, Fuller, Renaissance Re, the National Weather Service, Simpson Strong Time, State Farm, USAA, and Weather Predict Consulting. These are all founding partners for FLASH and have been with us over the last 15 years since we've been created. The goals for our webinar tonight are threefold. 
One is to provide emergency preparedness mitigation information to parents. And I see that we have about 7% of those who are on with us or, or, that are parents. Provide emergency preparedness and mitigation information for child care providers, and that seems to be a bulk of our audience tonight. Um, and then also highlight the resources that are available to parents and providers. As Sarah pointed out, we're going to cover a couple different things, um, a few different weather risks over the next 45 minutes. And that includes hurricane, flood, tornado, earthquake, wildfire, and winter weather. And my goal tonight is to spend at least five to six minutes on each weather risk and then allow for a couple of minutes for Q&A following each section. And then in case we miss any questions, we'll have at least hopefully 10 minutes at the very end of, our, of the presentation to answer any remaining questions and then also share available resources for you. So here's a map before you of the different regions in, our, in the country. And many of the participants tonight, as I understand them, are from the East Coast region here. So all the way from, uh, we've got the New England area all the way through Texas. We do have several from Minnesota and Washington and from California. Um, as well as Arizona. So I'm very glad that we have a good spread of weather risk to talk with you about tonight. I thought this would be interesting for you guys to see exactly what weather risks you're, you are facing in your particular part of the country. So the next section I'd like to talk with you about, and I'm going to go ahead and click these on so we can talk about these throughout the entire time, and that is really parents and providers can make such a difference by taking steps to be ready for disasters of any kind. So first and foremost, we would, we would recommend to you to create a disaster plan. So one, you need to know where you're going to go. So for the providers that are here and thinking about the different emergency plans that they need to have in place at child care centers, or maybe they're providing care for children in their home, you need to have an evacuation plan, have a meeting place, and a shelter and plan, a place plan, uh, depending where you are in the country. So for example, if you're in a tornado situation um, or an earthquake situation, you need to know what those shelter and place plans are. If it's a matter of evacuation because floodwaters are rising, you need to make sure that you've talked with your local emergency management officials to find out where those safe shelters and evacuation routes are. Second important part of creating a disaster plan is knowing who you're going to call. So for if you're a parent and you have children in a child care center or uh, you are, are running a facility to take care of children, a couple things that you're going to want to make sure that you do. One, um, parents need to provide at least two means of contact for getting in touch with them if a disaster occurs. Second, you're going to want to make sure that you're posting emergency phone num numbers by your landline phone, in your smartphones, in your wallets, in, your ch in the children's backpack very important, in, in fact, to also consider getting um, child identification cards if you're a parent or if you're a provider, encouraging those identification uh, cards to, to be secured for each child. And actually, parents can go to any state DMV with a proper identification to get those cards. A third component of that disaster plan is teaching children how and when to call 911. And the reason that's important is a couple, a twofold. Uh, one, if, if a provider is, let's say, um, unable to, to call for emergency backup because they're hurt or perhaps they've been knocked out, um, you, that child needs to know what to do. And an important component of teaching them how to, to dial for 911 is to show them pictures of emergency workers that are common to disaster scenes. So that way they understand, one, individuals that are helping out in a disaster situation wear uniforms and even sometimes wear protective gear. So walking them through that and talking, talking them through that and showing them pictures of what those emergency workers look like is a very important component of not only them being able to dial 911 and identify who they are and what their address is, but also the pictures of the people that will be arriving to help them on the scene. A fourth component of a disaster plan should relate specifically to children that may have disabilities or are dependent on medical equipment. And that includes considering having a two-week supply of medications and other supplies. And if they have medical equipment that requires electricity, you're going to want to make sure that there's a backup system, whether it's a backup battery or a generator, perhaps. 
and an important part of this particular slide before I go to the next piece, which is to build a kit, is there is a, a um, national commission on children and disasters. And I, I do believe Child Care Aware of America was very, very involved in that. And it's important to realize that part of the recommendations that came out of that commission is that they require child care centers providers to have evacuation, to have relocation plans, and to plan for children with special needs. So I just wanted to share that particular um, uh, information. I know that that actually has been something that's been talked about uh, multiple times over the last several weeks. So we're very pleased to be working with Child Care Aware on this presentation tonight. Okay. So the first part we talked about was creating that disaster plan. The second equally important component is to build that emergency kit, whether it's stocking up on bottled water. And a very important thing to remember um, is that when you think about how much water you actually need, and I remember when I first learned this how surprised I was, one gallon of water per person per day, um, which actually is stocking up on quite a bit of water. So water, batteries, first aid items, non-perishable food, uh, can openers, which you know a lot of people forget in a, um, in a kit, fire extinguisher, and making sure you have a full gas tank. And then, of course, for many of the providers and parents who have babies, um, some of the special items that are specific to them for sanitation purposes. That includes toiletries, moist wipes, garbage bags, plastic ties, blankets, bedding, um, clothing, toys and books. And I mentioned toys and books largely because when children are nervous or distracted, giving them something that's a point of comfort or helping them if they're even bored, something good to provide. And then in terms of um, emergency monitoring of information. You want to make sure that you're keeping an ear to the news on what's going on um, in the hours or even um, days leading up to a natural disaster um, for a tornado or for earthquake. That can just be a matter of minutes. But for hurricanes, um, sometimes even flooding, you do get a little more advanced warning. But at the end of the day, monitoring the weather in the news that's coming out. Um, we always would recommend NOAA Weather Radio, but there are also severe weather apps out there that can keep you posted. I know Flash has one as well. So just want to share that with you. And then important documents, uh, emergency contact information, copies of insurance policies, anything related to pediatricians. So for example, if you're a provider and you want to make sure if a child is hurt or injured during the course of a disaster, you definitely want to have access to the pediatrician information so that way if there's any prearranged uh, communication that needs to happen, that information is part of what you're keeping for that child. But also recommend considering a portable generator, uh, particularly if you're a facility. Now, a lot of times um, parents you know, and providers, when you think about having that plan and building that kit, it really needs to be a, a strong understanding of what that emergency preparedness plan is for, for a facility for a child care center. And so having, having an available plan that you can provide to parents or parents asking for a copy and one being available, um, finding out what that evacuation plan and what you're going to do if you need to transport the children that are within your care or understanding um, how your child will be transported if in a child care um, center environment. And also what the plan would be, again, for a special needs child. And then the communications component. So how are you going to notify those parents if you're in a disaster situation? Is it going to be by call or by text? And that's where those two contact numbers really come in handy. And the other important part, and I think this is a, a very interesting story to share, and that is a child care provider um, in Oklahoma, more Oklahoma tornado, who was sharing the story of how parents and staff pulled children from the rubble after the tornado struck there. And the child care uh, center owner was commenting on the fact that the first responders passed them by because they were rushing to a nearby destroyed hospital. And they had no idea that the destroyed child care center was full of children in need. And so I mentioned that story specifically to you tonight because you can actually reach out to your local emergency management officials Share with them that you have a child care center uh, in operation, whether that's an at-home care or whether it's an actual facility, and let them know um, that you have children in your care. And then the third component after you 
uh, build your plan and build a kit is to practice that with your with your family or with the children that you are in your care. And we would really encourage you to do that on an every six month basis. So if there's anything we hope that you take away with you tonight, it would be these three things. And so Sarah, can we go ahead and take our quick poll of those who are participating tonight? Okay, great. It looks like we have almost everyone voting, so we'll give everyone just a few more seconds to get their votes in. Okay, great. So here are the results. Can you read those off for me, Sarah? It looks like we have 39% have one at work and at home, 29% only have one at work, 9% only have one at home, and 22% do not have one but plan to after watching this. Great. So if we have the opportunity to influence at least 22% of our audience tonight, that's, those, are great, those are great stats. So kudos to those. Um, who are on this presentation tonight and have taken steps, and kudos to those who plan to take action after our webinar tonight. Okay, so I'm going to launch in the next portion, and I'm going to start focusing on the weather risks one by one. The first one is hurricanes, and what we'd like to show you here is a map of the United States, of course, but that also highlights by varying levels of risk where hurricanes have historically made direct hits in the United States. And clearly, we've had some, some new his, historical um, experience in the, the northeastern part of the section of, of the U.S. with Superstorm Sandy last year. And in fact, we're coming up on that anniversary here on October 29th. So what I'd like to talk about next is really the ABCs, um, what we fondly call for hurricanes. The first one being anchor. Bring anything, so in a hurricane situation, you know that one's approaching, typically you might have 48 to 72 hours to prepare for landfall. You want to make sure that you're bringing anything in from the yard that could be windborne uh, missiles, essentially, and ask your neighbors to do the same. That could be um, lawnmower equipment, it could be patio furniture, it could be garbage cans, it could actually be some uh, things from your garden you need to consider that some of those could be lifted up and launched and break your windows. And once wind um, intrudes into the house, it does compromise your roof and does compromise the other openings, doors, and windows. We would always encourage you as a preemptive strike um, to, to try to replace any gravel or rock landscaping material you have with fire-treated shred bark or other lightweight mulch, so that way those we eliminate the potential for, for them to become windborne missiles. And then trimming down and anchoring trees and foliage. So many of us along the East Coast have you know, beautiful shrubbery, beautiful trees. A lot of them happen to be very close to the, to the house. So if you can trim those trees and branches far away where they don't become hazards and uh, fall on your roof or fall on, on cars, we would recommend that. We would also encourage you to secure an inspection to make sure you have strong wall to foundation connections. And the next part of our ABCs we would draw your attention to is brace. And that includes bolting all doors with foot and head bolts with a minimum one inch bolt throw length. A lot of this may seem like technical information. And so I want to mention at this point that we have several different resources at flash.org that can walk you through the very specific how-tos. And we include either through animation or actually a, a real person showing you how to do this. Um, on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash forward slash strong home. Okay, so back to bracing. We would also encourage you to reinforce the garage door and track if you don't have an impact, impact resistant garage door. And there are several, several different methods for doing that, but typically it's that horizontal bar that runs 
in the middle of that garage door, as well as reinforcing the, the track that the doors roll up and down on. And a lot of times you'd be surprised if you move it. It tends to be a little bit shaky, and you can just reinforce that with screws in several strategic locations. And of course, we would also recommend bracing gable and walls with horizontal or diagonal braces. A lot of that is where the peak is in your roof. Um, if you don't have a hip roof, if you have a gable end roof, where it's open, a lot of us uh, along the East Coast have homes with even gable end vents, those, those openings that look slatted. You want to make sure that those walls are properly braced. And then, of course, for some of these um, particular um, portions of the house, you may want to consider using a bonded license and insured professional. We always would encourage you to check out the Better Business Bureau to see if there's any background information on those professionals. The next section is cover. So ABCs uh, cover in the next part of, part of the series. And that's covering all large windows and doors, especially, especially patio doors. Um, and a lot of times folks don't have impact resistant shutters. Um, but there's a couple of different things you can do, and that is we have a, a specific tutorial on the Flash.org website that a lot shows you specifically how to cut emergency plywood and make it specifically fitted for your windows. So if you do need help um, for those emergency shutters and you, you need to use plywood, we provide you with that assistance as well. And then making sure that all those doors and windows are properly caulked and weather strips so that way when you have wind-driven rain, um, you have usually two areas of the house that are at risk, and that is one, if your doors and windows aren't properly caulked, and then two, of course, your soffits. Um, the soffits are the area underneath your roof line that run all the way around the house and are typically vented either with holes or with flats. Um, those are the soffits, and you want to make sure that those are properly secured so that way you don't have water intrusion. And then, of course, we would recommend installing a roof covering that's graded for high wind. And then finally, in the ABC section, strapping, tying down anything that's freestanding fixtures in your yard, whether it's your shed um, or perhaps some other freestanding structure. A lot of times these aren't covered under, under insurance policies, but they can easily cause damage to your main structure. So we would encourage you to tie those down. And then within the house, inside your roof, we would encourage you to also uh, look at hurricane straps and clips. And we do have a video on our website um, with one of our, our experts that actually takes you into a roof, and he takes this flashlight in there, of course, encourages you to get in there early in the morning before it gets too hot, but shows you exactly what you should be looking for, whether it's nails that have missed uh, the beams and are um, showing through, they're called shiners, showing through your roof deck, or if it's a places in your roof where you can actually add these straps and clips to strengthen the uplift resistance to wind. Now, some of that content I just covered is really very, very technical. So I'd like to now move to, for parents and providers perspective, in a post-hurricane situation, some special considerations for children. Um, a lot of times, and, and this is um, something I myself learned in the 0405 hurricane season, we had four back-to-back -back hurricanes each year, so a total of eight over a two-year period. And how many children um, that I learned became injured because they thought it was fun to go out and uh, play out in the, in the flooded lakes or uh, canals or um, and just to get outside of the house after the hurricane passed. But the challenge is there's so many down power lines typically and metal objects or trees that are near, even though they look harmless, they're not. So that's one thing we would specifically point out for protection of children, whether you're at the home or you're at a child care center. Another is not to use matches in storm-ravaged areas until all gas lines are checked for leaks. Um, and I'll share this story with you of a homeowner that I worked with in New Jersey who had experienced um, tremendous storm surge from Superstorm Sandy, and said the one thing that he noticed beyond any beyond the destruction all around him when he exited his house is the the hissing sound from the open gas lines um, in his neighborhood. So just want to share that with you, you know, as as um as an FYI. Also, be aware that flooding from storms bring those pest, pesky pet problems. So whether it's insects or snakes or mice and 
And of course, the risk of bacterial contamination is something to consider. Another thing that I've experienced um, in, in previous forms is that you also have pets that get disconnected from their owner or they run away because the storm has, has scared them. And a lot of times you'll find confused animals that can be somewhat dangerous if you're not careful. Um, so that's another thing to be aware of. And then, of course, avoid turning on the power at your home if there's any kind of flooding uh, present. So that way you don't have any kind of electrical uh, shock. <clears throat> OK. So before I move to the next uh, slide to talk about Stormstruck, which is an educational exhibit that we have in Epcot in Florida, I uh, want to open it up for some questions. OK, great. We have had a couple of questions come in. So um, as I mentioned, if you have questions as we move through tonight's webinar, please type those into the questions box on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, one of the questions that came in, it was during the portion of the emergency plan and emergency kit. Uh, the question was, what happens if we are outside? Outside in a hurricane? Um, just outside. If their disaster plan is for when they're inside, what if they're outside when disaster strikes? The number one thing we'd recommend is find a sturdy, permanent shelter nearby. And this is, you know, again, regardless of the peril, there are um, safe shelters that are designated by local emergency management officials. And if you contact uh, the, your area or local emergency management office, they'll tell you exactly where those are. And typically, they range anywhere from schools nearby that serve as shelters. Um, it can include malls, airports. You'd be surprised at the number of facilities that emergency management officials are able to designate in times of need. So I would encourage you to look at what's the nearest permanent sturdy structure or shelter to go to. Great. Um, some more questions that are coming in here. What if we are on a playground and see a tornado? The number one thing you need to do in a tornado situation is immediately get into the safest inside structure that you can get to, permanent, permanent structure. And we'll talk a little bit more when we get to the tornado section about where you need to, what part of that structure you need to, to seek shelter in. So typically in a home, for example, if that's the closest thing nearby, you want to go to the lowest level of that house. And if there's not a basement level or lower level, then you want to go to a small interior room with no windows, as many as you can safely get your children in. Great. Um, a question here says, if you keep one gallon of water on hand for each person, our center would need 200 plus gallons. How often do you need to replace them and switch them out? I think that's an excellent question. In fact, um, typically, we recommend Every time you take the kids out to practice, which we recommend on an every six-month basis, you would want to replace any non-perishable food items and water at the same time. OK, great. Um, some of the questions that we have here, let's see. What larger items do you recommend for a household emergency kit? Hmm. Larger household items. Well, I think the largest that comes to mind is obviously a generator. Um, I think when, from a perspective of we've talked about the food, we've talked about the water, we, we haven't really spent a lot of time talking about first aid supplies. Um, so you want to look at having sterile adhesive bandages and this, you know, latex gloves. Um, sunscreen would probably be a good option. Um, for some of those smaller children as well, particularly if you're outdoor for several hours uh, waiting for emergency crews to arrive. You want to have non-prescription medications that are you know, given in age-appropriate dosage, dosages for all family members, whether that's aspirin or antacids for stomach upset or um, anti-itch cream or even anti-diarrhea medication, just because nerves may, may, may be at play. Um, some other special needs that might arise would be a generator or battery backup. I think we talked about the medical equipment um, side. You may even need extra contact lenses or extra batteries for hearing aids or any other communication devices. Um, for infants and children, that might mean diapers, uh, might be bottles. It could mean powdered milk. Um, so that just to give you a sense of some things that would be important to have in the kit. 
Okay, great. Um, we have a few more questions coming in, but do we want to go on to the next section and hope to get to these at the end? Well, I know we're at 7.30, so let's keep going, and then I'll keep taking questions after we go to each section. Perfect. But first, before we go to the next peril, what I want to uh, share with you is a very quick two-minute video about Stormstruck. And this is a concept that's been in place at Epcot and Disney World since 2008. It was initiated by the Federal Alliance for Safe Homes, and we do have partners that help support that. And what I want to offer to everyone that's participating in the webinar tonight, if any of you are ever in Orlando and would like to participate and have a private tour of Stormstruck at Epcot, we welcome that opportunity to share this experience with you. Um, but if you don't, we certainly want to at least give you a two-minute preview of what we offer in terms of disaster safety and preparedness. allowing me a couple of minutes to do that and I just want to reiterate our invitation for everyone tonight where we would love to be able to do a tour for you in Stormstruck in person. Okay, I'm going to take us to our next one which is flood and knowing your risk. And what you see here before you is a map um, again of the United States with those jurisdictions based on um, low risk to high risk, what where you are prone for for flooding. And flooding is really the nation's costliest disaster and the deadliest. Um, and this picture that you see before you is actually a photo that was taken by FEMA in Boulder, Colorado that experienced that tremendous flooding, disastrous destructive flooding, um, just a couple of weeks ago. And the easiest way to determine your flood risk is to contact either your local growth management or building department, or you can visit floodsmart.gov, where you can actually enter in your zip code or your city and they'll tell you what your level of risk is. And of course, it's important to mention that since most homeowners insurance policies do not cover flood damage, um, and there is a 30-day waiting period, it's important to, to buy flood insurance if you're at any level of risk. So one of the signature initiatives that FLASH and the National Weather Service worked on together was Turn Around, Don't Drown. And it was amazing what we've learned through flooding over the last several decades, um, but it's 
most people don't even realize that it only takes six inches of water to knock you off your feet. And so, and a lot of times children are very attracted to, to playing uh, when they're splitting and, and not understanding that there is a very real risk for injury and even death when it comes to rising floodwaters. Um, so this, it's an important thing to, to point out to children, whether you're a parent or you're a provider. If you're in a child care center and, and floodwaters are rising and you haven't been asked to safely evacuate, um, one of the things you want to consider is, is sandbags that can divert water away from your home or away from your child care center. And typically we recommend that for filling up those sandbags, you want to make sure they're at least two-thirds full. And of course, you tie, tie off those bags at the top of the tie. One of the things I'm going to just click on very quickly here, these flashcards that you see before you, we have those on all of the perils that you are potentially at risk for across the country. And those flashcards are available on our website. And what I've done is embedded here um, that link. And the flashcard, if I toggle down here, let me pull it to this other screen. you see the front cover of our cards. And then on the second one, we give you some very specific safety rules to follow. These are things that you can sit down with uh, with your children, whether they're in your care as a provider or as a parent, and talk to them about the safety precautions that they should be following. OK. Some things you can do to strengthen your home or strengthen your, your care center. Uh, the number one thing we'd recommend, if financially uh, uh, possible for you, is to increase the free board, which is essentially uh, the pilings underneath your home to at least three feet above base flood elevation. Um, if you are unable to elevate your home, we certainly would recommend that you elevate your utilities, um, whether that's your air conditioner, your water heater, if you've got washers and dryers, um, that are outside, make sure that those are at least elevated if you can't elevate your home. If you have a fuel tank, and this is really important also because flood waters are so strong, is that you need to be able to anchor that to the concrete slab um, so that way it doesn't become one of risk to life, um, an injury, or a risk to causing damage in your home and allowing water to come in. And then some other things that you should consider, installing a sewer backflow valve. And you can work with your local um, building department to find out exactly where in the line and what type of valve you need for your particular, whether it's your home or a child care center. Um, also consider wet and dry flood proofing methods. Those are typically the vents that you can have installed underneath your home, so that way water can easily pass through, or walls that easily collapse away. And then some special considerations for kids. One of the things we're learning about um, now even from the Boulder, Colorado floods is the extensive cleanup that will be going on in taking weeks and weeks. And a lot of people are already talking about some of the fumes from cleanup because you're often using you know, very stringent cleaners, bleach, um, as well as mold spores and airborne germs. So just something to be thinking about if you have kids that are helping with cleanup, or even parents that are volunteering, for example, at child care centers as part of cleanup effort, you want to make sure that um, you have the proper supplies and the proper tools and take the proper precautions um, for those individuals. And this particular slide will show you some of the things to be thinking about um, and making sure you have in place. OK, so before we move on to earthquake, I'd like to open it up for some questions if we have some. Great. Um, we do have some questions coming in. Um, we did actually have someone comment saying that they're heading to Disney this week. And last time they were there, um, the girls loved it. So they're really excited to check out Stormstruck. Yay! That's great. Excellent. OK, so let's see. We have some questions coming in. OK, so this person says, we had a gas leak at my old center, and we were already outside for outside play. Um, the office staff, staff kept moving us further and further away until every time we got the children settled. Is there a certain number of feet to be away from the building? Hmm, That's a good question. I think it just depends um, on the particular peril that you're facing. Um, again, if you are. 
Um, in a situation, if, they, for example, you're in an earthquake situation, you don't want to be anywhere near the building. You need to be seeking shelter several uh, feet away from the building. If you're in a flooding situation, you need to be seeking higher ground, for example. Um, and that may be you know, quite a trek away from where your center is or your home is. Um, but again, the key there is seeking higher ground. Again, we would encourage it at that particular point, if you can go to a nearby sturdy, uh, safe, or designated uh, shelter, we would encourage that as well. I hope that answers the question. That's great. Um, one of the questions that came in is, where can we get a list of shelters in our area? Typically, your local emergency management um, or even your state emergency management office, because they coordinate together. There's typically a statewide emergency management plan, and then they coordinate with the local emergency operations centers. Um, I would encourage you to go to either one of those websites, and they typically have a list of designated shelters. Great. And I think we'll take one last question in this section, and that is, is there a printout available for items that should be in a home emergency kit? Yes. In fact, we have a checklist on our website, and there's also several other excellent websites that, that have um, great checklists as well, including ready.gov um, and AmericanRedCross.org. Great. Well, I think that we'll head into the next section. Okay, super. Okay, our next peril is earthquakes. And I know, uh, at least based on the list I saw sign up, we had at least a dozen from the West Coast. And what you see before you is a map, again, varying levels of risk um, where there is earthquake activity and risk for earthquakes. And of course, you, we see a lot here on the west coast side with uh, California and Washington. But I would also point out here, and this is the new Madrid seismic zone, um, from Tennessee, uh, Kentucky, all of these areas here are at risk for earthquakes, even though we know the last time that they had earthquake activity was back in the 1940s, but interestingly, um, the USGS Geological uh, Survey Society has indicated there's, they're certainly at risk because there's been lower level earthquakes in the area. And then of course, um, here as well. So knowing your risk. Um, I know a lot of times, we, whether we're parents or we're providers, we want to know is our center or is our home in a seismic zone? And one of the ways you can do that, we had indicated if you want to know if you're a flood risk, go to floodsmart.gov. If you want to know where your earthquake risk is based on where you live, you can go to this website here that um, is on the screen. Also, what you can do is ask FEMA for some, some credible referrals to conduct a seismic assist assessment on your home. But here are some questions here that we would certainly encourage you to ask of anybody that's coming out to perform that assessment. Um, and I would just point these out to you. Was the home built before 1985? Was it built on a raised basement, basement or a cross space foundation? Is it on a hillside? And do you have occupied space above the garage? Now, surviving an earthquake. Um, and this is very important because earthquake can strike whether you're at home, at school, or at work at any moment. So the, the buzzwords, the key one is drop, cover, and hold on. So earthquakes can last anywhere from a few seconds to a few minutes, if, and that's indoors. So you want to find a table, get underneath, cover your head with your, with your arms and your hands. If you're outdoors, you need to move into an open area, away from trees and buildings and utility wires, anything um, that can fall on you. And recovering from earthquakes. Um, again, we have those, you know, make sure that you're checking TV, radio, internet for emergency information. Make sure there's no one with injuries that need first aid. Um, you want to make sure you're checking, again, those utilities for gas and water leaks or broken electrical connections. Um, if you're a provider and you, you need to make sure that you're prepared to turn off those utilities in the event they're damaged or leaking, um, you might have spilled medications or flammable liquid. Make sure you clean, clean those up immediately in case um, there's a potential risk in addition after an earthquake occurs. And then be aware of anything that's moved around in cabinets. You know, if you have toys or books that are stocked up, if you're a provider, have boy, books and toys stacked up in, in closets that if you open those doors, they could fall out. So you want to encourage children not to be opening those, those doors after an earthquake occurs. 
What I'd like to do for us now is play a very short, this is um, actually four minutes, four and a half minutes, um, a very good earthquake. And I was sharing with Sarah um, when we were talking about the presentation on Friday, um, it's funny how you can watch a video and start thinking, gosh, if I were a provider, there are so many takeaways from this video, Not you know, even besides an earthquake. So we'd like to play that for you now and, and look forward to take some questions afterward. Unlike some other natural disasters, there is no season for earthquakes. They can strike at any time, day or night, without warning. The majority of the United States is susceptible to an earthquake of some magnitude not just the West Coast. The central Mississippi Valley, parts of the East Coast, and the U.S. territories are also at risk. So it's important to learn how to protect ourselves from earthquakes. Start by looking throughout your home for items that could cause injury, break or cause property damage if they fall, move or dislodge during an earthquake. This can be done by following these three easy steps. Look up, look around, and look down. First, look up. Identify overhead objects that need to be secured. For example, ceiling fans, chandeliers, and pendant lights should be supported with a minimum 9-gauge wire cable that is bolted to the ceiling joist or beam. The cable should have enough slack to allow it to sway. Next, look around. There are five categories of items you'll need to be on the lookout for. Hanging decorations, heavy furniture, items located on shelves and tabletops, electronics, and cabinet doors. Secure hanging decorations like pictures and mirrors by hanging them from closed hooks. Or you can close open hooks with a pair of pliers. The number of hooks needed for each object will depend on size and weight. Large objects are more stable when hung from two hooks and are sufficiently screwed directly into the stud. Hooks that are simply embedded into drywall or plaster are likely to pull out, allowing objects to fall. Move heavy furniture like bookcases, china cabinets, and entertainment centers away from beds, sofas, desks, or other places where people sit or sleep. Take special note of anything heavy enough to cause bodily injury or that can block an exit. Secure heavy items once they've been moved. Use flexible fasteners such as nylon straps to secure top-heavy furniture to at least two wall studs. L-shaped metal brackets with lag screws into studs can also be used. However, Flexible fasteners are better because they allow objects to sway, reducing the strain on wall studs. Items on shelves and tables can fall and break, creating dangerous conditions. In more severe earthquakes, they can become deadly projectiles. Install a lip edge or other type of restraining device to keep books and other objects from sliding off shelving. Keep your electronics like televisions, stereos, and computers secure with buckles and safety straps that allow for easy relocation. Secure other items like lamps, pottery, and collectibles with Velcro glued to both the items and furniture or non-damaging adhesives like earthquake or museum putty, clearquake gel, or microcrystalline wax. Secure doors to kitchen cabinets and other storage units like entertainment systems and china cabinets with childproof hook and eye or positive catch latches to prevent stored items from crashing to the floor. Once you have completed the steps described so far, you are two-thirds of the way to better protecting your home. The final step is to look down. During earthquakes, unsecured appliances often fall over, rupturing rigid water and gas connections. Secure your water heater with two steel straps screwed into the studs or masonry of the wall and install flexible corrugated copper water connectors. Most earthquake fire can be as deadly and destructive as the earthquake itself and often starts with gas leaks. Make sure appliances such as stoves and clothes dryers have flexible gas or electrical connectors to reduce the risk of fire. Locate your gas shutoff valve and make sure you know how to turn off the gas supply to your home with the use of a wrench. Be sure to keep the appropriate wrench close to the gas valve. Consider installing an automatic gas shutoff valve that activates when sensors register ground shaking or an increased flow in gas. Finally, Relocate any flammable liquids to a safe garage or outside storage location. For financial protection, contact your insurance company or agent and consider purchasing earthquake insurance. Remember, to protect your family, home, and belongings, look up, look around, look down. For more information on protecting your home, 
visit flash.org and fema.gov. Okay, Sarah, and why um, I switched screens before going back to the presentation, I want to open it up for any questions we might have. Okay, great. Let me pull these up here. Um, in an earthquake, is it a myth that you can stand in a door frame? That is indeed a myth. We would recommend you drop, cover, and hold on. Um, with 16 to 18 students, how and where and when do you think we should have them stop, drop, and hold? Well, and, and I think this is a, a great time to mention that there is actually a practice drill across the United States that's happening on October 17th. It's called the Great Shakeout, um, which would be an, an ideal time to practice with, with the children that are in your care. Um, and I think it would be exciting for them to even to, to patch into um, another opportunity to do that drill with kids across the country. So one, I'll mention that. Two, I think to the extent that there are tables, uh, perhaps that's where they have their breakfast and lunch, um, or any other place where they are able to drop, cover, and hold on. Um, and again, we would encourage that you get to a, a place and the, a safe place within the facility. Um, the most, most dangerous thing you can do is really go outside, and if you are outside with the kids, then as I mentioned earlier, you want to make sure that you're staying away from the buildings, trees, and power lines so they don't fall on you. Okay, great. Um, this question here says, if your center is a large space, one level floor, would the big adult bathroom be the best place for kids to be at the wa as the water goes into the center? You get in a flooding situation? I think that that is what they're referring to. All right. In a flooding situation, if the, if the center is not actually at a high point, if the entire uh, building is at risk for flood waters, then actually going to an interior room is not going to be the safest place. Um, if your center is at risk and in a flood zone, the first thing you want to do is find out how, where you can safely evacuate your children um, to get to a facility where it is out of, of harm's way or out of risk for floodwaters, particularly since floodwaters can ra rapidly rise. Okay, and I think we'll take one last question in this section, and it's, what is a good way to keep children calm during an emergency? Really, uh, you know, the, the best answer to that is to be calm yourself. Uh, parents, providers, um, other other employees working in a child care uh, setting should be practice, practice, practice. If you have a plan, if you have a kit, if you've practiced it with your children, then when the time comes, and hopefully it's a you know it's an if, not a when. If the time comes, you're prepared and you can calmly coach those kids and what those steps are going to be and remind them that we've practiced this and we're going to make it through. Okay, great. And I think we're ready to move on to the next section. Okay, thanks, Sarah. Okay, our next peril is tornado. Um, and this one is particularly near and dear to my heart after watching everything that's happened um, with the more Oklahoma tornadoes. So on the map before you, you see, again, varying levels of risk depending on where you are in the United States. Um, and, and historically, tornadoes are most active in Tornado Alley here, which is from the northern part of Texas all the way up to the Great Lakes. Um, but certainly that we have seen tornadoes spinning off from um, severe weathers and thunderstorms in multiple areas in the, in the country. In fact, my colleague, Boyd, who's um, helping me drive the webinar tonight, was driving back from a Disaster Safety Expo in Tampa last week and um, had to pull over and seek shelter in a nearby country and in suites because there was tornado activity. So um, it's amazing how you work in this, in this uh, disaster safety field and seems to be affecting you in so many personal ways. Okay, this is a very important part um, that I want to share with you, and that's safe rooms. Uh, one of the things that we learned, 1,300 homes damaged from more Oklahoma tornadoes and nearly a dozen, a couple of dozen um, individuals that lost their lives, including um, a grandmother and child. And what I'd like to point out here is the flashcard again. And I won't open it up because I know we, we have some time constraints. But on the back of this safe room card, 
are very specific guidelines and instructions for what that safe room can look like, whether it's a permanent structure that you seek um, that's exterior to your home, or it's a safe room that you build uh, based on an interior closet, um, and you get the appropriate uh, retrofits completed in order to make that a safe room. There are a couple of different options that you can choose, and they range in, in vary in prices. Um, in fact, I know there are a couple of projects that we're hoping to, to help with in Oklahoma. So if I have anybody here from Oklahoma on the phone, please don't hesitate to reach out to me um, after this, this webinar to see if maybe we can help you uh, down the road with, with installing a safe room. Um, but I would encourage you here two big things. If you can install a safe room or have a storm shelter built, that's excellent. If you don't have the opportunity to do that, then the number one thing to do is work with your local emergency management officials to find out where that nearest um, safe shelter is for you. And again, a lot of times you'll see malls, airports, other schools, churches um, that have been identified as safe shelters because they meet those standards. So tornado safety during. Um, if you're indoors, go to the lowest floor to a small center interior room or under a stairwell stairwell or interior hallway with no windows, crouch down as low as you can with your face uh, down to the floor. Try to cover yourself with a blanket or mattress if you can. Um, if you're in a mobile home, we hands down recommend that you would um, evacuate that structure and go to a nearby permanent structure. A lot of times we hear from um, parents and providers really, okay, should I jump into my car and try to escape the tornado? No, you should not. You should never try to drive to escape one. The tornadoes can change direction really rapidly. Um, so in, the, in this instance, if you're in a vehicle, you go to a nearby permanent structure. Don't shelter under an overpass um, or a bridge. And the reason why is those uh, winds can easily uh, suck you from beneath that overpass or bridge um, because it acts as a tunnel. If you cannot safely exit your vehicle, definitely park it out of traffic lanes. That was something that we saw another Oklahoma tornado that, that touched down, I think, within two weeks of more. Um, stay in your vehicle with the seatbelt on. Um, put your head below the windows and try to protect yourself with arms or any kind of blanket coat or cushion that you might have. And if you're outdoors, try to shelter in a, st in a sturdy building. If not, lay low to the ground. Now, we, we have heard, and I want to mention this really quickly, um, of folks trying to seek uh, shelter in drainage ditches. Um, and I think what's important to remember in those situations is you need to understand that there's also rain happening at the same time because those drainage ditches, ditches um, also are um, valves for, for water flow. And we did hear a story of a young man who um, was seeking shelter in a drainage ditch. And unfortunately, there was also some flood waters coming at the same time and he didn't make it. So just some things to be aware of um, in terms of sheltering. In an after scenario with tornadoes, you want to get out of that structure, a heavily damaged structure, as soon as possible. Um, a lot of times, too, um, there are down power lines. There's, there's water that hi are hiding live, wi live wires. Um, you want to make sure you wait for emergency personnel to arrive to help you, and with children in particular, um, before a tornado arrives, make sure they all have their shoes on because if the building were to, you would need to evacuate the building, you want to avoid them uh, getting hurt from sharp objects. Okay, before I move on to wildfires, I'd like to open it up for questions. Okay, it looks like we only have one question that came in regarding tornadoes, and it says, in a tornado situation, is it safe to hide between your mattress and box spring? I think, um, again, it's uh, probably more important to uh, suggest that you get to the proper room in the house. Um, and if your bedroom is in an interior section of the house, lowest part of the house, um, that might make sense. Um, but again, we would recommend you lie face down on the floor and cover yourself with something. So in that instance, we'd say take that mattress um, and cover yourself with it, but make sure that you're, the, you're on the lowest part possible, which is the floor. Okay, great. I think we're ready for wildfires. Okay. And this next map that we're showing you indicates the levels of wildfire risk um, in the United States. 
And again, I would point to the flashcards that we have here, and I'll point to some just some key points. Uh, one is removing that dead grass and leaves and twigs that are within 30 feet of your home, um, and pay with particular attention to, to the gutters that are, that are in your roof, in large part because these are highly flammable in a wildfire situation. And that includes not storing firewood within 30 feet of your home. For get grills and gas cans and lawn mowers, keep those as far away from the phone as you, from the home as you can. Um, also, identify emergency water supply within 1,000 feet, whether that could be your pool, that could be a dedicated water source, such as a, as a hydrant. Um, and in some communities where there is high level of risk, there might be a community um, water source as well. One great mitigation tool that you can do is install a 1 8 inch metal screening on your soffits, your vents, to protect from embers coming through because once they pull into the house, um, it really takes just a matter of moments for a house to sit fire. Um, and then if you can plant species around your home that are retain moisture and resist ignition, um, we encourage that as well. And you can check with your local forestry agency on what type of plant species are best to plant. We also have that information on our website at flash.org, as well as a wildfire wizard, which kind of walks you through what you can do with your home and actually maps out your house um, and gives you recommendations. Any questions there on, on wildfire? Um, it looks like the question that came in was regarding those flashcards on your website, but I believe you answered it. OK, great. And then our last, Carol, and this is kind of one Sarah and I decided to throw in, in there on Friday since we we're uh, heading towards the winter months, and that is kind of what it's looking like based on the Farmer's Almanac to outlook for this winter. Um, and it will show you here where there's going to be above normal temperatures and how to plan for that. And so what we'd want to point out here is, again, we have a flashcard that really shares with you the before, the during, and the after. Um, I note here, too, when we say make sure you have smoke alarms and carbon monoxide detectors, because a lot of us, obviously, we turn on either um, lanterns, gas heaters, or fireplaces uh, to keep ourselves warm. When you have smoke alarms and the carbon monoxide detectors, you should be checking the batteries on that on a monthly basis. We, we would consider that the uh, best rotation for prevention. Of course, keep those space heaters away from flammable materials. Insulate your exposed water pipes. In fact, there are really cost-effective um, things that you can buy, um, really a, a foam dome drip. I don't know if everyone's heard that term before in winter weather. But it's actually a tool you can get at the dollar store, and it's a couple of dollars, and you put it over your, uh, your piping mechanism to avoid it from, from freezing. And then, of course, um, some, just some of the basics, close off unoccupied rooms. Um, and this is important when thinking about kids. If you're opening those cabinet doors to allow heat to get to the uninsulated pipes, just remember that the, you know, obviously children might get a little curious and want to crawl in there, too. So that's just something to be aware of. Um, if you're a provider or a parent. And of course, never try to thaw a frozen pipe with an open flame. And I think we were able to cover six perils, at least within the last hour. So I am wanting to open it up for some questions anybody might have. OK. Um, one of the questions that came in is, if there is a winter storm that knocks out the power during child care hours, the best way to keep warm is Warm and safe is blankets, correct? That is correct. If you do have a backup generator, however, then hopefully that would mean you'd still have access to electricity. OK, one of the questions here is, what is the appropriate use of candles? Oof. We, we are a uh, no on candles shop. So okay. no candles at all when it comes to uh, safely sheltering from, from winter weather. OK. Um, one of the questions from a little bit earlier, um, I believe it's in regards to the emergency kit, is in a family child care home, what is a good way to carry all of these items? Oh, that's an excellent question. Um, a lot of times we recommend, if there's a kit that you can have for each child that they could carry in their backpack, um, we would always recommend that. If there's any kind of other carrying mechanism that you would take typically on field trips, um, I would encourage you to consider that, too, to make sure that's stocked up. But really, having a kit 
per child that's under your care and actually walking them through the important components of that kit, what they use it for, why it's important to take care of it, and it's specific to them. And um, I think that's an important exercise to do. So backpacks typically are very helpful in that instance. OK, great. Um, one of the questions here says, how would a provider provide for a special needs child if the power goes out and they don't have a generator? Oof. OK. Um, for a, a child with special needs that relies on medical equipment for, from an electricity standpoint, if you don't have access to a generator, then you absolutely need to make plans for a battery backup, and you can work directly with the parent um, to make sure that's provided. OK, great. Um, it looks like that's all of the questions that are coming in right now, so I think that we've answered all of them. Um, oh, one last question just popped in, and that is, what extra prevention can you do during a cold winter? Oh, extra prevention. Hmm. I do think uh, one thing that we didn't cover, if you have a hard snowfall um, and you're, you're clearing sidewalks and you're clearing walkways, there's always that potential for slip and fall, um, especially with young children. So it's very important to make sure that you have, one, a plan, and two, a communication with parents um, to just make sure that you're operating as safely as possible with those kids in your care. OK, great. Well, I think that looks like all the questions that have come in. So I would like to thank everybody for joining our webinar tonight. And thank you, Tammy, for hosting a great webinar. Um, I really feel like I learned a lot over on my end, and I've seen these slides, so I thought it was a great webinar. Thank uh, you. It was a pleasure to join you guys tonight, and um, I don't know if we're going to conduct that last poll, Sarah, so I can oh, see what, what works best for everyone. Yeah, let me pull that up right now. So this last poll, what did you learn in tonight's webinar? And you can select one or more of the answers so we have an idea of what you took away from tonight's presentation. I mean, there was a question that just came in regarding the slides and if people will be able to access them following tonight's webinar. And that's a great question. And we will put the slides up on our website so you can view them at a later time, as well as post the recording to tonight's webinar. OK. I'm going to close the polls here and share the results. It looks like 85% of attendees felt that learning how to build an emergency kit was the most valuable thing to them. 60% said learning about hurricanes, 62% said learning about earthquakes, 65% said learning what to do in a flood, and 58% said learning how to prepare if there is a fire. Great. So it sounds like we had some information for everyone. That's a wonderful takeaway. And um, thank you again for everyone that took time out of their evenings to participate in this webinar. We we hope that this was beneficial for everyone. And please never hesitate to reach out to us at flash.org um, or in, through any, any of our social, social media networks. If you have follow-up questions, we're here for you. OK, great. Well, thank you again so much, Tammy. And we look forward to seeing everyone on our next webinar. We hope you have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you.